Hi everyone, it's Elise from Kid and Cloud Coloring Classes and today I'm going to be showing you how to color a simple bow with your alcohol markers that you can use on absolutely any of your projects or images that you come across with a bow on them. Now we're going to be going through how to create depths, folds and use light source to create all the dimension on the fabric here today. So this tutorial today is actually a chapter from our brand new Botanic Notes coloring class, which is our April and May 2021 coloring class project. If you'd like to color up the full project with me, you can find the full class over at kiddingclatter.com and you get the full image for free as well. However, today I've just extracted just the bow for you and you can grab the free stamp and all the colors that I'll be using in the description below the video here. If you're already a class member and you haven't started this lesson yet, consider starting with this one here today. Breaking down your classes into smaller little goals like this is great if you're feeling a little bit nervous or even if you're a little bit time poor. Even just putting aside 10 minutes to color is all you need to make a start, learn something new and take a mindful break for your self-care to recharge and de-stress. So let's go ahead and jump on in. Now before we get started, I'm just going to run you through some art theory basics which cover the why behind what I'm doing here today. So when coloring any object, it's important to first keep in mind light source. So light source is anything that makes light in our scenes and it's really important because without light, we don't see the objects on the page. So typically in our classes, we work with what's called ambient lighting, which is a major source of light in the scene, like sun or overhead lighting. And these cast big cones of light over your entire project, rather than coming in from a side that you may have seen in other videos before. This is more directional or spotlighting. So when we approach ambient lighting, what happens is, is anything that's raised up towards us appears lighter and brighter because our light rays come down and hit those raised areas first. We call this our highlight. Now the opposite of highlight is the shadow. So it's the parts of the object that are further back from those light rays. So they end up a lot darker. Now, in between highlight and shadow, you have your midtone. Now, midtone is usually considered the true color of an object because it's not affected by light or shade. Now, one more important thing is your cast shadow. Now, cast shadow is the thing that's going to help you get a lot of depth in your project. And it's a thing that I see people leave out the most because they haven't actually learned this. You don't know what you don't know. And obviously with art, there's a lot of fundamentals and theories that can really help you take your uh, coloring and projects to the next level. So a cast shadow, I'm just popping this over my hand now. Can you see the shadow that's on my hand? This is your cast shadow. It's a shadow that's cast by an object in front or above onto an object below or behind, and it helps to show the distance between objects. The closer these objects are together, the darker and harder that shadow is, and the further apart they get, the softer and more dispersed it becomes. So it's showing levels, it's showing distance, and that helps to create that depth in your project there. So when we look at coloring our little bow here today, we want to keep in mind all of those light source theories that we've just talked about. And don't worry if this feels a little bit overwhelming. Whenever you learn anything new in life, there's always going to be a little bit of a learning curve before it all sinks in. So you may need to watch this or go over a few different tutorials where we explain the light source a few times before it really clicks. But as you start to color and as you repeat the process, the more it will make sense and become second nature. Just remember, just because something challenges you, it doesn't mean that you're not capable of doing it and that you shouldn't do it. It just means that you're trying something beyond what you currently know. And the best thing about this is that's how we learn, how we grow, and how we improve. So really embrace those challenges that come your way because you're doing this tutorial, obviously, because you want to learn something new. And that's exactly what you're getting every time you're challenged. Okay, so let's break down this light source really quickly. Now you can see here, I've got a double bow. So you can see we've got two loops on either side as part of this image, and then we've got the tail sort of dangling down here. Now, when we have the loops like this, so we, what we know is the fabric is coming around and then it loops back around into the knot in the central point. So we wanna think about how that fabric is being pulled tight. 
Whenever we work with fabrics, we've got what's called a tension point. So a tension point is wherever a fabric is pulled tight, sewn, it hangs off the body, something like this where the fabric is tight. And usually whenever you have folds, they always come from that tension point because that's where the fabric is being sort of pulled in tight like this. So if I take a look here, what I can see is that we've got a knot straight in the middle. So when we create a bow, we knot the ribbon together and the knot in the middle is our tension point. These two bows out to the side, they each come from this middle part. And you'll notice in each of these little side parts, we've got a tiny little fold and that's coming straight from that knot as well where that tension point is. So when we color a bow, we always want to keep in mind wherever those loops are, we're generally going to have a little bit of a fold coming from the knot. So no matter whether you're working with a single bow or a double bow, you can always add this detail in, even if it's not a part of the image. And I'll show you how to do that when we get coloring. You can see on some of these, I've actually got the line folding back in on itself. This is because my bow here is quite long. Those loops are quite drawn out. And because I've got a lot of that excess fabric, I wanted it to make it look like I was getting that really droopy sort of effect in the middle. There's no right or wrong way for how long your folds should be whenever you draw them in. It depends on so many different factors, how tight your tension point is, the type of fabric or ribbon that it is, how it's falling as well. So you can really take a bit of creative license with how you do that. Another form of tension point that we have is at the loop here, the very edges of these loops. What happens is the ribbon's coming through and then it's wrapping back around in on itself. And this in itself creates a little bit of tension. What we actually get here is you'll see a little bit of the darkest color on the sides. So that's coming from that little bit of tension point and it's also showing that our sides are curving around and away from our light. So that's why we get a little bit darker on the edges of our loop. Now you'll notice here as well with this loop, I can see straight inside there. So what this is showing is that we've got the bow loop curving back in on itself and the position of the loop is kind of tilted up toward us that we're seeing that bottom side as well. Because this part here is underneath, we add quite a nice deep dark cast shadow here because what we're doing is that we're essentially showing that this is on top and this little part here is behind. So remember we talked about cast shadows before, whatever is in front casts a shadow on the part that's behind. So even though this is one loop of fabric, we essentially have two parts to it. So you can have a cast shadow even if it's just one object. If the object curves back in on itself, then you'll treat it like two. The tail here hanging down, we often get a little bit of a fold coming at the start of that because it's coming from that knot or tension point in the middle as well here. Okay, so that's a little bit of the theory to get us started. And again, I know it can feel a little bit overwhelming hearing all that, but let's jump in with our coloring and it's going to make a lot more sense. So I'm just going to move this on the side and I'll grab my printed out image. Welcome back to the video tutorial. Now I'm going to be using my purple blend here today to color up the bow. And again, you'll find those colors listed in the video description. And I've also got color blends for other popular brands of markers listed there as well. But you can use absolutely any color blend that you like here today. If you'd like more information on how to make color blends, I recently did a helpful video tutorial on how the official Copic numbering system works as well. So you can take a look at this to familiarize yourself with how we pick blends based on creating the depth with our light source. Now I usually color dark to light. You can color light to dark or dark to light with your markers. It doesn't really impact your final result at all. However, I find dark to light usually uses less layers of color. So because I'm a little bit thrifty, I like to show you tips on how to save a little bit of money as well. And the ink is a little bit expensive with your markers. So where we can save, we may as well try to. So I'm going to start with my darkest color here today, which is V09. I'm holding the marker nice and close to the nib here, and I'm going to be holding it upright so I can work just on that very tip. 
Now a few little pointers before I put my marker to the page. You'll notice I'm resting my marker on my second last finger here. Some people rest it on this last one. There's no right or wrong way with this, but what I find is that people often say that it really helps them to lift it up and practice on this second finger. I'll show you why just at the bottom of the page. If I'm on this last finger and I go to touch my marker to the page, you'll notice what happens is I very quickly push the marker down into the paper. Whereas if I lift my marker up onto the second finger, as I go down to touch my marker, you'll notice it's not touching yet. So I have the ability to control coming in and just tapping my marker against the paper. When we do our marker coloring, we're never pushing the marker down like if we're writing. It's just very lightly touching the tip to the surface of the paper. I'm just gliding the marker over that edge. You can even just focus on moving your hand back and forth as well, rather than moving the marker at all. This can help you get a finer line. However, getting fine lines just comes down to practice. So you have to remember that if your lines are thicker than mine today, it's totally okay. You may still be learning that marker control, whereas I've had quite a lot of years practice with this. The more you do, the easier it gets. Sometimes you have to do a few practices you don't love though, just to help you gain that control. All right, so with this V09, I'm gonna pop in and do my cast shadows first. Nice and easy because we know right where they're going to be. I'm applying them to the inside part of that loop. And you can do the same on the other side here as well. Now the knot in the middle, the knot usually sits forward of those loops. So you can imagine if you had a bow, I should have a, a ribbon bow here, would have been a little bit easier to explain, but you've usually got the knot and the little loops come out from underneath. So because that knot's sitting on top, we add a cast shadow straight around it. That's going to make it look like it's really popping out toward us. Now this loop here is sitting behind this one. The reason why we can tell that is if I follow this loop around, I come along here and I get to this point here where it intersects. Now what's happening is the line I was following continues back to the knot, so that's uninterrupted. However, the line of this loop here just stops. Now we know in real life, a line doesn't just stop. Something's happening there. So if we imagine what's happening is that's coming around and it's going underneath and connects back to the knot. So because of that, we're going to come in straight underneath and add in that cast shadow there as well. You can do the same on this little side as well. I've got a little bit of a cast shadow through there. I'm just curving back these little cast shadows as well. So we're showing the inside of those little shapes. Now we can do a few of those fold lines that we were talking about earlier. So from this knot, I'm going to extend out a small little fold line. Now I'm gonna curve it back in on itself. That's a little bit more advanced. If you're comfortable with your fine lines, you can do that, or you could just do it as a little line. You're welcome to do it as long or short as you're comfortable with. I'm doing the same on the other side here and on this little one too. And there's a little one at the top here as well on this loop that's hiding behind. I've got a little cast shadow through the knot as well because we've got two parts to the knot where it's overlapping. Now, for those of you who don't have this class, you've got the bow as it just finishes. However, on my one, I've got leaves. So I'm doing a little cast shadow beneath the leaves. they're sitting in front. Now the two tails, I'm going to do a cast shadow beneath this where the loop is sitting above. Don't really have one on that other side. You can do a little bit of a fold line extending down. And I've just come down the, the little edge there as well. And same on this side. Now, if you're not comfy with fine lines, don't worry about these little folds in the middle. Just apply a little bit of color to that edge there. And you might even want to do just a little touch straight through the middle of that tail as well. Now, one last thing before I move on, 
Remember, we're going to add a touch of color to the very edges, and you can just blend that in a little bit as well. That's showing where the loop is curving around to the other side and a little bit of that tension point. So that's my darkest color all done. That's actually the hardest part of the video is adding in all of your shadows. Now all we're doing is we're blending out. So what I do is I grab my next lightest color, which is VO6, and I'm going to apply straight over the top and then extend a little further out. Now I'm doing multiple strokes over the top so I can blend out the transition between these colors so it's a little smoother. As I blend out these fold lines, I'm coming straight over the top and sort of within. Come in from the sides here now and we'll blend this in toward that fold line. So you can see I'm sort of mimicking that shape that's left over there, that U shape. Always blend out any cast shadows as well. And again on this side, mimicking that sort of U shape. That's going to help create that curved effect there. Now coming in on the tail, now if you only did the line down the side, you're just blending this out toward the opposite side. If you've got the little fold, you can do what I'm doing here now. I'm blending the side in toward the middle and the middle in toward the right there. So our ambient lighting comes down, we usually hit those side edges first and that's why I'm blending out. Now on this side, this tail is facing the other way, so I'm going to change directions. Now I haven't really done, I should have a cast shadow around that little part there, but I'm just being conscious of doing too many details that aren't in the little free image here today. So those of you in class, make sure you pop that little cast shadow around. Your video is a little different from this one anyway, so you've got all that in the classroom. I'm coming around that knot in the middle. Now my next color, VO4. Actually, I'm going to be real quick and do the little car shadow in there because it's bugging me a little bit. Okay, and then I can blend that out with that VO6. My next color, VO4. And again, I'm just blending further in multiple strokes over what I've done previously, starting to get that all looking nice and smooth. If you're using good marker paper, you can really, really build up that depth of color with multiple layers, and it will hold the layers of color as well. So if you're feeling like it's not looking 100% smooth, just come back and keep layering it up before you move on. Coming into the tail and the same thing, we're blending out to either side. I'm gonna add a little bit up the side of that second part in the knot. And now I'm at my lightest color. Now my lightest color is B01. Now with this color, I'm going to bring this in toward those highlight areas. As I come around that very fold line though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and leave just a little slither of white. Now the reason why is that's going to help me increase the contrast between light and shade. So it's going to make the dip in toward that fold look even more dramatic because you've got such a stark contrast in those colors. So what I do is I just come in here, I'm doing multiple strokes to blend out the previous color. And then I'm gonna try and leave just a tiny little slither of white. Now that is a little bit more advanced to do. So if you don't quite get it today, that's okay. It's something to work towards for next time. Remember when you do your coloring, if you don't love your result from this tutorial, 
That's absolutely normal when you try new techniques and especially new art theories as well. If you find it challenging, remember like I mentioned at the start of the video, it just means that it's actually a lesson you need to do. It's an area you don't have a lot of practice in, so practice it. Print it out again, have another go. Try it with a different color family or color blend. And if you're really stuck with our classes, I always do free private tutoring with our members as well. So you can send a photo through on email or on private messenger on Facebook, and we can chat about some personalized tips to help you feel more confident getting started. Don't ever feel nervous to do this as well. You don't have to be a class member. I'm always available to help. But our classes are more of an art therapy approach than anything. So for those of you that don't know, I'm actually a trained art therapist as well. And we always talk about confidence and self-care tips in our classes as well to help you feel confident. And don't ever feel nervous reaching out. It's all about just helping you feel confident to keep learning. Trust me, I've seen and made every mistake possible. <laughs> So you can see that's actually my blend all finished up today. We've got a lot of beautiful depth happening on the page. Now, one thing I just did want to run through though, is when we do our blending with alcohol markers, what can happen is we can desaturate some of the colors as we're blending. Now, what I mean by that is you see, we went from dark to light. The way that alcohol markers actually blend is you've got an al alcohol solution with a darker dye in it. And we're basically adding more alcohol, which is colored with a lighter dye over the top. So imagine that you're essentially diluting color down on the page. So as we do your blending, you're actually pulling away some of that darker dye or making it appear fainter. So this can make the colors sometimes look a little bit washed out. And the first time you do the blend, sometimes you might get lines between colors that might not blend as smoothly as you'd like. What you can do is actually repeat everything again to build up a little bit of extra depth. Now, this is always optional. You may love what's in front of you and you don't need to do anything else. But every time we color, we color a little bit differently and we may have used more layers trying to blend something out in particular. So this is always a helpful tip if you feel like you need this, just that little bit of extra depth. So what I do is I literally repeat everything again. So I'm just going to show you on one part and that way you can compare and see the difference. So I grab V09 and I'm literally just coming in and laying this straight over where I added it before. Because I've already got that base of color down, this is going to allow it to come up a lot more strongly, a lot more vibrant. You can see already how much stronger that color is holding on the page here now. This is VO4. So I'm literally just, it's literally repeating it. So nothing super tricky. And then VO1. But can you see, hopefully that picks up on the camera. Can you see the difference? It just has so much more depth this time around. So I'll leave that up to you. If you feel like it needs that little bit of extra depth, come through and just repeat everything again. Or you can simply leave it where it's at. So this is how we do a basic bow. So whether it's got just two loops, whether it's got four or multiple, you can apply these techniques to absolutely any image you come across. I'd love to see you do some practicing. Make sure you tag me in any of the photos that you share online as well so I can see how you go. And try and actively find an image with a bow on it to color up now that you've done this tutorial. The more you practice, the more it becomes second nature and the easier it gets. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick lesson here today. Remember, if you'd like to color the full image with me here today, you can find the full class over at kidandclatter.com. It's absolutely suitable for beginners. They break down all the very basics, just like I have in this lesson. So don't worry if it looks a little bit scary. We're going to go through it all nice and simple for you so you can feel confident, even if you're just starting out. Florals are such a great technique to do as well if you're a beginner because it's all about being a little messy and a little textured. There's less perfection and everything is less precise when you do nature, which I always think is really nice when you're still learning that market control. So hope to see you in our classrooms. And if you have any questions at all or would like some extra tips, please don't hesitate to reach out. Hope you've enjoyed this lesson and see you next time. Happy coloring.